Okay, uh, before I start talking about this stuff, are there questions about the metaphysics exercises or anything like that? Yes. No one had trouble accessing the reading or anything. What? Yeah, I don't remember if you can tell access the readings if you're the UC bookstore online. Oh, that. Oh, in other words, the the e text for, yeah. What? Well, <laughs> I mean, inside more than syllabus, uh, readings on the syllabus, or like I the readings on the reading section in the uh, website you link. Is there like uh, more? From like textbook readings that you also want us to go through, or does it highlight in the syllabus like when we're reading from the uh, text, like textbook? The syllabus lists all the readings that are assigned. I'm not, I'm not sure what you. Okay, just making it. Okay, <laughs> not their secret readings. <laughs> only, only the wise will. No, the, the syllabus, syllabus lists all the readings that are assigned. Okay. Um, all right, yeah, so you said you're having trouble accessing. Uh, have other people tried to access the ebooks and anyone else have trouble doing? Well, okay, I mean, you should well, like why don't you email me and I'll try to and I can see because. Like I can email directly the person in the bookstore who's in charge of this whole thing, and uh, you can get to the bottom of whatever the problem is. All right. Okay. Other questions like that? All right. So um, the readings for this time are are supposed to be heading towards the main problem in this little introductory part of the course. And the the name of the main problem is the uh, categorical status of the differentiator. Um, And the problem is there's these things called differentiate. And uh, this is not good because I'm standing in front of it. Um, so there's these things called differentiate, and which I'm going to say more about what they are in a moment. But um, it seems like, um, well, it seems like if they're anything, they must be either substances or accidents. Because remember from last time, the definition or what we're taking as the definition of accident is that it's something that's in a subject. And a substance is something that's not in a subject. Um, but, uh, everything has to either be in a subject or not be in a subject, right? So it seems like everything either has to be a substance or has to be an accident. Um, however, when you try to determine which the differentiate are, you get to, into problems either way. That's the problem of the categorical status of the differentiate. Um, and, the the problems you get into when you go either way are number one textual problems in Aristotle, right? That is, you can find texts in Aristotle that seem to imply that there are that uh, differentiate our accidents, and you can you can find other texts that seem to imply that they're substances. So uh, there's textual problems in Aristotle, and there's also I guess. You'd say conceptual problems, like trying to understand where there's room in Aristotle's system for these differentiate. Um, and um, 
once again, for Aristotelians, those two problems are not cleanly separated, right? That is, they, you know, on the one hand, there's a problem like, or maybe I should say not in Aristotle's system. On the one hand, there's a conceptual problem, like the things that make different kinds of things different from each other, what are they, <laughs> right? That's like a conceptual problem. And it's, and then we, when we think about it, it becomes hard. Because you know that big tub? Oh, let me uh, mute this. Um, so when you think about it, it becomes hard to understand. And then on the other hand, there's things that Aristotle says that seem to be about that topic, and it's hard to understand what Aristotle means. But if you're an Aristotelian, those two things go together, right? So like you're trying to figure out what to say about the things that make different kinds of things different from each other. And you want you, what you say to, to end up being a good interpretation of Aristotle. <laughs> so you have to solve the textual problem and the conceptual problem. Um, um, And in fact, it's even more complicated than that because the question of how to understand these texts turns partly on the question, when is Aristotle using a word in two places in the same way, like accident or quality, for example, and when is he using it in different ways in two different places? Now, um, one of the main points of Aristotle well, end, yeah, but Somehow I became no longer the host, and it was it's like, do you want to unmute yourself? Can can actual looks like most of the people on the Zoom call are AIs, but <laughs> <laughs> no, it's like a whole bunch of otter pilots. But <laughs> if there's if there's someone real in Zoom land and you can't hear me now, let me know. <laughs> what they could let me know in the chat. Yeah, they hear you. Oh, <laughs> yeah, that's true. Uh, a message. Oh. Right. Oh well, if they can hear me, they could tell. Oh, and they just did. All right. <laughs> okay. Um. So, uh, what was I saying when that all happened? Um. Oh, so one of the main points of Aristotle's philosophy is distinguishing the many different ways in which words are said, right? And in fact, there's a whole book of the of the um, the collection of books we call the metaphysics, um, which is uh, which every chapter begins. X is said in many ways, right? So like being is said in many ways. Genus is said in many ways. I don't like like. Um, uh, and, you know, I mean, why was Aristotle so, so, I mean, I think Aristotle was the first person ever to think systematically about this issue, and we still use his terminology. <laughs> so, um, why was he so fascinated with it? Well, I mean, I think it's because, and this is the explanation for a lot of things in Aristotle, he's thinking about Plato's Socrates, right? So he's thinking of like Socrates coming and asking you what X is and then getting you confused and contradict yourself, right? And so like one of his, one of the possible responses to that, that Socrates interlocutors mostly don't know how to say, and Aristotle is working on the terminology to say it is, well, that's one sense of the word and that's a different sense. <laughs> Um, okay, so anyway, um, what that means is that when people after Aristotle are discussing how to interpret Aristotle, they're they're 
in, including us, <laughs> right? They're basically like directly or indirectly using Aristotle's thought about interpretation about how to, you know, deal with possibly ambiguous words and whatever. <laughs> um, so they're also interpreting that. <laughs> Um, okay, I mean, uh, there actually are issues that, that that there actually are issues that have to do with that complication that come up in this topic. I don't know if I'm going to say anything about it or not, but uh, but it's not just uh, um, like me deliberately making it sound more complicated than it is. That really is. Right, like with two Aristotelians are arguing of whether this is a univocal use of a term or not, they may disagree with each other about what univocal means. <laughs> All right, so in any case, um, um, and I mean, so, but uh, because this is, you know, that Aristotelian terminology is crucial to dealing with this problem, that's why I also assigned some readings about univocality and equivocality, right? Or, I mean, the the Greek words are, homo are homonymous and synonymous, and the Latin translations are uh, equivocal and univocal. All right. Um, so, uh, um, okay, so uh, so that's like the backdrop to, to how this problem is going to work out. Um, but first, obviously, to make sense of the problem, we have to say what differentiae are. Um, so what is a differentia, right? The singular is differentia, and the plural is differentiae. Um, well, and obviously, that's why I, I brought in that long reading from Porphyry. Um, um, and again, I think, like, as I say in my explanatory note, everything in Porphyry's Isagogy, or almost everything, it comes from somewhere in Aristotle. He's put it together and arranged it. Although it's nevertheless, it's true, as I said last time, that contemporary Aristotelians will say that he rearranged it in such a way as to you know, make a completely distorted interpretation of Aristotle. <laughs> All right, but um, it's the traditional starting place, right? So if we want to know what these people are arguing about, um, uh, this is the right place to start rather than, you know, um, ask a contemporary Aristotle scholar what differentiate are. All right, so, and here's what, Porphyry says about the differentiae. Defining differentiae, they say, they is like, right, he says at the beginning that he's going to be transmitting what he's received from the older authorities, right? So defining differentiae, they say, a differentia is that by which the species surpasses the genus. For human has rational and mortal beyond what animal has. Okay, so here's one definition of differentia. There's the genus, for example, animal. And then here's a species of the genus, human. This is a species. Um, and human has something beyond what animal has. Right, meaning that um, just being an animal is not enough to make you human. And you need something else also. Now, no, this isn't about, although you know, Aristotle does think this, but this isn't about humans being like better than other animals or something, right? This applies to any species. So like if you have, horse, just being an animal isn't enough to be a horse either, right? You need something else beyond just being an animal, whatever it is that makes you a horse. That's this first definition. They also give the definition of differentia thus. A differentia is that by which each thing 
differs. That's the name differentia, right? Um, for human and horse do not differ according to genus. For both we and the irrational animals are mortal animals. Right, so there's, according to Porphyry, there's another, there's an intermediate genus here. Let me, let me draw this picture. So under the genus animal is genus mortal animal. What are the immortal animals? Remember I said last time the immortal animals, I think this is what he means. The immortal animals are the celestial bodies. Right, because uh, um, Porphyry and yes, Aristotle. I'm not sure if it's true that Aristotle thinks this, but uh, Neoplatonists all think this and attribute it to Aristotle that the celestial bodies are alive. Yeah. So, like the differentia is like. Sorry, I'm just trying to understand. Basically, so like it's like if um like horse and human are both considered animals, but it's what differentiates them as species from one another. Like horse and human are the same, but they're going to be in the same genus. Yeah. So that's that's the second definition, right? The first definition he gave didn't require there to be another species. I just said it's whatever it takes to be the be the species beyond what it takes to be in the genus. Okay. But now the second definition is what you were just saying. It's what makes horse and human different from each other, even though they belong to the same genus. Okay. What, um, um, for human and horse do not differ in genus, for both we and the irrational animals are mortal animals. But rational, when it is added, divides us from them. Now, I mean, um, when we say it's what makes horses different from humans, um, it's not going to be everything that makes every human different from every horse, right? Like, here's Socrates and here's Bucephalus. Well, uh, like, Bucephalus is bigger than Socrates. Um, Bucephalus is a different color from Socrates. Bucephalus has the hair all over, and Socrates doesn't, you know, etc. Right? Bucephalus eats, doesn't eat meat. Socrates, I guess, I've heard that Socrates that didn't eat meat. Right. So, um, right. So, or I mean, I guess I could say Bucephalus can't digest meat. Socrates can't. Right. Bucephalus is a herbivore. So, Ray, like, there's a lot of differences. <laughs> um, and there's just a simple difference that Bucephalus is not in the same place as Socrates at the same time. Uh, presumably, they weren't contemporaries at all, right? Uh, Alexander the Great was Aristotle's student, so the horses don't go very long. So there's no way Bucephalus was alive when Socrates was alive. But, 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 um, um, so what we're asking for here is um, not what makes each individual human, uh, some individual human different from some individual horse. We're asking, what is it that makes human a different kind of animal than a horse? Yeah. On the next slide, the different you also is like under the category of human. Um, like what differentiates one individual human from another? Um, because they're both under the species for me. Right. So um, this is. I mean, I already started with what I just said, but this is why um, you like we can't understand the different definition of differentia differentia without the definition of the other five predicables and how they work together. So like what I just said is that the differentia is like somehow supposed to tell us what kind of, how these two kinds of things are different. Okay, so they're two different species. And, th and, and this is the last definition, right? But further working out matters concerning differentiae, they say that a differentia is not any chance thing which separates members of the same genus. 
right? Like, here's two members of the same genus. Also, by the way, here's two members of the same genus, Socrates and Plato, right? They're two members of the same genus. Um, it's not just anything that separates members of the same genus, but only that which contributes to the being and is a part of the what it would be to be of the thing. So what we're asking is, um, that, that last definition says that a differentia has to be part of what makes the, um, the things that have it what they are. Um, and, um, and so like, we're understanding here that there's, there's, there's some specific answer to that, right? Like you can't just classify things any which way. <laughs> there's a real classification of things that are that different for each, for each other in kind, and they're different kinds of things. And there's something that makes them the kind of thing that they are. Yeah. Okay, so you could have like a uh, differentiate within a genus camel between one humped and two humped camel then. Okay, right. Or, or, or you, you might think that, and, and this is what you were just asking, right? You might think, okay, under human, maybe there's further species. Well, I was asking that it is just to differentiate just apply to the species in the nature, just may apply to like part of Right. So, I mean, so, so from what we just said, um, well, I mean, I think we have to read the definition of species first to address this. So here's the definition of species. Um, species is said of that which is under the genus given in a definition. In this way, we are accustomed to say that humans is a species of animal, animal being a genus, and white is a species of color, and triangles a species of shape. Therefore, they also give the definition of species thus. A species is what is ordered under the genus, and which the genus is predicated of in the what is it. And further, they also say, they also define species thus. A species is that which is predicated in the what is it of many things which differ numerically. But that last definition given would be a definition of the most specific species, which is only species. Whereas the others would also be definitions of the species that are not most specific. So here what's going, here's what's going on here. We're saying there's, there's two ways things can be different from each other. Things can be merely numerically different. That's the case of Plato and Socrates. What does that mean? It means they're the same kind of thing, but there's two of them. Or things can differ in, the, in what kind of thing they are, right? In the what is it, or the what it would be to be, or the essence, or the quiddity, right? Quiddity means whatness. Um, so um, like Socrates and Bucephalus, Socrates and Bucephalus differ in species because they're not just any, they're, they're not different from each other only because they're not the exact same thing, <laughs> but they also are different in kind. And what Porphyry is saying in the definition of species is that one way of, of meaning species, it refers to the lowest species. So there is a lowest species. And human is supposed to be an example of the lowest species, right? So what that means is that the things that fall under human differ only numerically. They don't differ in species. So there aren't any other things that come below this. As opposed to, for example, this genus, mortal animal, right? So here's the other. Celestial animal. Right. Um, so, like this has a differentia that makes it different from this species, 
right? There's the genus animal. They both belong to the genus animal. This has a differentia mortal that makes it different from this species of animal. So, um, um, so it meets that first definition in porphyry. A species is what is ordered under the genus in which the genus is predicated of in the what is it, right? So if you ask what is a mortal animal, the answer is it's an animal. That's what kind of thing a mortal animal is. And then the differentia that, that takes it beyond the genus and makes it different from other species of that genus is mortal. But mortal animal is not a lowest species. So like regarded relative to this, it's a species, but regarded relative to the species that fall under it, it's a genus. Yeah. But um, differentiate uh, isn't just any quality that makes a species different, right? It's the essential quality. Right. Um, how could you ever figure out or decide what an essential quality is? Like, even the word rational, I'm like, I can believe that a crow is rational. I mean, I'm not a biologist, but they're... They seem pretty factual, <laughs> or I don't know, but you know that. Yeah, no, so I mean, that's a good question, right? <laughs> so, and I mean, a lot of people in the early modern period say uh, you can't, and this makes no sense, right? Like Locke, for example, mm -hmm. right? The, Locke says this whole way of looking at things makes no sense. Um, so, uh, I guess the question is, is there a way to look at it that you can kind of see why it would seem to make sense to someone, at least, right? And I mean, well, Locke's way of thinking of things runs into problems. I mean, it's it's hard. You can't talk about things at all without dividing them into types, right? Um, and, you know, um, um, and it's, I mean, it's worse than that in a way because uh, um, it's hard to understand. When I say you can't talk about things at all, it's like it's hard to understand how your your words kind of um, can hit some things and not others in the right way, unless the things are already kind of classified. Yeah. That's right. So, I mean, so, th so there is something to this way of looking at it. And, you know, and, and contemporary philosophers often help themselves to the idea of natural, right, cutting nature at the joints or something like that, because it's uh, so hard to do anything with that. Um, so, I mean, so the question is good and, you know, uh, but, but there's reasons to try to try to find a way out of it, I guess that's it. Yeah. My question is more to do with like, what about like different like species of like the same animal? So, like you can talk about like birds and then there's like, yeah, you know, like ravens, hummingbirds and stuff like that. And, and we know those things because of like their location but they're still birds, like, but, but what about when it's like less obvious with like canines and like dog breeds, like, because the differences are like, for the most part, not like they don't matter. I, I think you're asking something like, how do you know when two things are different, different species or when they, I'm, I'm not, yeah, I was, thinking, I was thinking about about a horse, you know, and like a donkey. Yeah, they're I I don't know, like to, to like a random passerby, they both would be like horses. You know, you wouldn't, you really wouldn't take the time to be like that's actually a donkey. 
I'm not crazy. Yeah, yeah, like, yeah, yeah, yeah. So last, you know, like the rule. Yeah, I yeah. uh, like yeah. By it. Like why did they in a normal course? Yeah. I'm saying normal course is anything that's not like a massive you know, bite. <laughs> why is it the lowest species? They can reproduce together. You know, so that's that's a modern definition of scarce, right? Uh, um, that you know, and and it and it's a that's a good definition of species given a certain evolutionary explanation of speciation, basically, right? Um, but I, I don't think anyone. I don't think. I mean. I wouldn't be shocked to see that someone said that in the lectures, but I don't think I've ever seen that. No, so how do you know? Well, I mean, in the in the examples people talk about all the time, it's usually obvious. <laughs> um, they, you know, um, uh, and I mean, the truth is, a biological species. And this is something we now explain by with an evolutionary explanation, right? Biological species t tend to differ from each other in many different ways and be like easy to distinguish from each other. Um, um, so do so are like other different minerals for completely different reasons, <laughs> tend to be like really different from each other, right? They have different weight, they have different crystal structure, they have different color, they have, et cetera. Um, so it's like, so as a practical matter, it's usually pretty easy to say whether two things different species or not. But, um, but yeah, I do think it's worrying. It's another, or another way of coming at Locke's problem about this, or another one of Locke's problems about this, that you know, it's worrying. How what are we actually using to decide which classifications are species and which are not? I mean, you know, and um, and there's worrying like shifts within Aristotle, right? I think you notice that. Although Porphyry says, and this is the traditional answer, and it's what Aristotle says in the, I guess, this is the beginning of the ethics, the politics, or somewhere like that. The definition of human as um, the animal that has logos, right? Reason or speech. <laughs> um, it's both kind of, right? But anyway, um, but in other, many other places, Aristotle seems to think the definition of human involves bipedal. Right? And this is, you know, there's like a famous story. You know the story. Okay, maybe not everyone knows it, right? That, that supposedly, I mean, this is like most of these stories, it's almost certainly not true, but it shows what something was what someone was thinking about, right? So the story is that that Plato is lecturing and defines a human as a featherless biped and Diogenes the cynic is like you know stands up in the back and is holding up a plucked chicken and says this is Plato's man <laughs> right so um, um but right so like according to sometimes it sounds like we should divide animal into um like animals with feet and animals that don't have feet, and then you should divide this into bipedal and other, <laughs> I guess, you know, the quadrupedal, whatever. And then this, you should divide into ones that have feathers and ones that don't. And then the ones that don't will be humans, and then the birds will be under here. And the... <laughs> So, right, like this is a completely different structure that's implied in that definition. Um, so, you know, I mean, like most Aristotelians agree that rational animal is the correct definition of human, and that featherless biped or other variants on that, even though Aristotle says that more often, are really just. Um, 
they are ways that you can pick out the genus human, but they're not giving the definition. They're not giving the account according to the essence. Um, that has to do with, so we've mentioned three of the five predicables. Fourth one is proprium. Um, and that has to do with what I was just talking about, right? Aristotle says, or sorry, Porphyry says <laughs> uh, that proprium is, at least in the strictest sense of proprium, is something that all and only members of a certain species has, but it's not essential. So for example, being a featherless biped might be a proprium of humanity, but not a differentia, right? Or the, the example Porphyry gives is apt to, being naturally apt to sail. <laughs> I guess that's somewhat questionable, but anyway, I mean, that, Right, that all, I mean, of course, not all humans sail. I don't sail, <laughs> but, uh, but I guess the idea is that humans are a kind of animal that have the capacity to, to make boats and sail and no other animals have that. And so uh, and all humans have that and therefore it's a proprium of humans, but it's not the definition. Right, I think, you know, you can see why, in, again, in a case like that, you can see like, on the one hand, yes, this is going to be a good question. How do you know? Maybe featherless biped is the right definition. But on the other hand, you can kind of see, especially with an example like apt to sail, right? That like that's not the yeah, that's a capacity maybe that all and only humans have, but that's not the capacity that makes us what we are. That's like a consequence of something, right? Like maybe being rational is necessary to sail. Yeah. Isn't um what like counts as a like defining characteristic of a species up to interpretation? Like I remember one of the examples was that throughout the word but of uh, being able to name for like horses is unique to only horses, but not a defining characteristic. I feel like though there is argument that um Maybe to us, how we define a horse is, you know, a maze. Well, that's not how, what do you, I'm not sure what you mean by we, how we define a horse. Like we, like, you know, biologists define species in a weird way. It has to do with type specimen. <laughs> um, but, but, but I guess you mean like, isn't it up to us? We could define horses, things that, that have the capacity to net. Or I mean, is that not um, a differentia? Right. So the Porphyry is, says that that's that that's a proprium of horses and not a differentia. Um, I don't know if Aristotle uses that example or if that's Porphyry's own example. The classic example, which is in Aristotle, is the capacity to laugh, right? Which he says is a proprium of human beings, but is not a differentia. But, um, well, yeah, I mean, I guess that that's the same question I was just addressing. How do you know whether it's appropriate or differentia? And it's 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 not easy. But on the other hand, it seems like they, from a certain point of view, it can seem like there must be something to this distinction, right? Like there's not not just everything that a bunch of things happen to have in common and make them different from everything else. It makes them what they are. Um, so, um, I mean, Hume, when he talks about Aristotelian philosophy, will say that it, that, that what the Aristotelian philosophers allow themselves to do was they, they just allow their imagination to run away with them and all the principles of just like the way we tend to imagine things sort of <laughs> got like built into their system. Um, so, I mean, uh, 
uh, notice that the examples I just used, Locke and Hume, are from 100 C, not from 100 V. <laughs> Right? These people are going to take it in a different direction. We'll see what direction they take it. Uh, they're also not happy with this whole system. But they do something different with it. Yeah. Where in Aristotle's philosophy is there the like historical pro progression of concepts? Like a hundred so years ago, there'd be minorities and women that weren't considered humans. Right? Like, it seems like concepts can be not all of them, but some can have a bit kind of historical basis that doesn't kind of transcend into like that sort of be transcending under it makes sense. Well, uh, so uh, Aristotle definitely does consider all humans to be of the same species, right? And so does Porphyry, right? You, know, you, you notice that one of the examples he gives of an accident of an inseparable accident he gives two examples they're both blackness but one is blackness in a raven and the other is blackness in an ethiopian right so they're, they're examples of two ways that something can fail to be appropriate basically one way it can fail to be appropriate is that all the members of the species have it, but also members of other species, right? So that's the problem with ravens. All ravens are black, more or less. <laughs> I mean, the more or less is actually also important, right? Aristotelians have to explain why, you know, like humans are bipedal, but some people only have one leg. <laughs> all right, but never mind. So, uh, um, but so all ravens are black, but there's lots of other black things, right? So it's not appropriate. Whereas the other example, the Ethiopian example, is an example of something that failed to be appropriate because not all members of the species have it. Right? So Porphyry is saying that humans, you know, some humans have different color skin, but they're a member of the same species, right? So. Um, Wouldn't that make it appropriate, but not a differentiate blackness? No, it makes it's not right for proprium has to be all and only, at least in the strict sense of proprium, has to be all and only the members of the species have it. Oh, okay. Right. Um, so, um, I mean, that's not to say that ancient people weren't racist in a way, although their racial categories were different from us, right? Mm -hmm. Like, they, I mean, they thought that. There are people who are too light, the northern barbarians. And there's people who are too dark, the southern barbarians. And then there was the medium people for the best in the middle. <laughs> right. um, but anyway, but 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 the basis for that was not classifying some humans as being a different species. All right, but I mean that's just that's just your example. Your the broader point is don't doesn't our classification change? And the answer is, I think, that Aristotle does not contemplate that. But our class could be, that, um, I mean, just as he doesn't really give an answer to the question, how do you figure out what, where, when two things are different in species, he also doesn't give an answer to the question, when might you change your mind about that? And why? Yeah. So for kind of like defining proprium, I get that they're unique to species and all that, but um, other than that, are are they just accidents that are said of a subject in regard to subject, or can they also be not said of a subject? Yeah, so presumably, I mean, this is where it gets confusing, because the fifth predicate is accidents. But presumably, both of these actually fit under accident in the sense we were talking about it last week. Right? So here's an example of the same the same word being used in two different ways. Mm -hmm. But can proprium refer to like grammaticality in a subject or like a concept of grammaticality in a subject rather than just like the like grammaticality uh, about, I guess. Right. So, I mean, 
Grammaticality is a disposition. It's a, um, and I mean, actually, like, if we think grammaticality means ability to write, which may be what the word means, right? I mean, um, uh, in fact, yes. The discussions of this question in Arabic, I think that is how they understood it. But it, it is probably, but anyway, so think about the, whether grammaticality is this or not. Think about the ability to write. This is this is a, a, a um, example that people often discuss. By the way, right, these are substance, right? Because these are secondary substances. This is the one that causes the problem. But anyway, right, so if you think about the ability to write, so in some sense, a baby, when it's born, has the ability to write. But in some other sense, it doesn't have the ability to write until it gets old enough that it could learn how to write. But in some sense, it doesn't have the ability to write until it's actually taught how to write. So, um, and in some sense, someone who's actually been taught how to write, but they're asleep now, doesn't have the ability to write. And in some sense, someone who's awake and, ha and has been taught how to write, but isn't holding a uh, writing implement, doesn't have the ability to write. And so, th so this is what's called first potency, second potency, and usually they only talk about two, but there's obviously many. Right? Um, so, uh, so anyway, like if ability to laugh or to sail is appropriate, then it's a, apparently it's a disposition of the sense of the first potency, right? So like you might also include ability to write here as appropriate human beings, even though this whole society, you know, where writing has not been invented and whatever, um, still all human beings are in the first potency to writing, whereas uh, horses are not. That's our questions. Yeah. What's the difference between individual quality and then a genus of quality? Would color be the genus of quality, and then white be something on the something like that, like the overarching? So I mean, so actually, so this is a question in Aristotle interpretation, but the traditional interpretation, which is what I'm following here, is that an individual quality is a, a quality that's in one individual, right? So here's Socrates, and when Socrates is pale or whatever white means in this context, right? this is the example. So when Socrates is white, there's a quality of whiteness in Socrates. Where is it? Well, it's not. It's not as a part, right? So this picture is misleading. <laughs> But maybe that's supposed to be indicated by the way it sticks out, <laughs> the Dorito, right? But anyway, right, so the whiteness is in Socrates. This whiteness in Socrates is not the same as the whiteness in anything else. It's its own being, its own thing. If you're a realist about qualities. This actually, in this case, even William of Ockham agrees. <laughs> this is a case where he's not a nominee. Um, there's one thing that's the whiteness in Socrates. That's an individual act of it. Um, whereas whiteness, so the thing that's in, if Plato is also white now, or for that matter, if Bucephalus, so Bucephalus, what color was Bucephalus really? I think he was brown. I've seen a picture of him. I don't know. Anyway, let's say Bucephalus. Oh, I know. Uh, Incitatus. Caligula's horse was white. <laughs> right? So here's the whiteness in Incitatus. Now, I mean, this is an inseparable accident, I guess. Right? Like he's always white. Although that's not true. Actually, my kids are into horses and they 
kind of like informed me that we shouldn't call white horse white, they call it grays. <laughs> a true white horse is an albino, and it's very unusual, his red eyes and whatever. But the horses we call white are actually gray, but they're they're gray when they're born and then they turn white. Anyway, never mind that. So the whiteness in Incitatus and the whiteness in Socrates are members of the same species, whiteness. But a few different examples, two different persona, uh, manifestations of it. Right. So they're kind of related to each other the way Socrates and Plato are related to each other. Right. Um, but we can we can also say whiteness, the species, is in right, like whiteness is in Socrates, and that but that means that an individual that falls under the species is in Socrates. Um, I mean, the example is not good because whatever whiteness means here, uh, it, uh, Socrates is not really the same color as a white horse. So, right? what, yeah. so the sourness in a lemon would be the individual quality, and sourness in general would be the uh, right, the right. genius of the bar. Like if this was a snowball. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Oops. That's probably good. But, but sourness in any lemon or sourness in this lemon? This lemon, right? That is. <laughs> All right. Um, call this lemon bread. No. Call this lemon. No, I don't know. Call bread. All right. I can't think of it. Actually, I used to use a bird as an example, and uh, one of my students suggested it should be named bird cephalus. <laughs> anyway, so we call this lemon Fred. If it's sour, there's an accident of sourness in the lemon. An individual accident of sourness. Does the genus also contain the various definitions of sourness? Like maybe you can describe a first that sour. Now it's no longer the case, but it has a different kind of definition. Yeah, that seems like an example of equivocal use of it, right? And so, um, because, and this, this will lead us to Aristotle's definition of equivocal, because if you were to explain what it is about the essence of this quality that makes it sour, it would be different, right? It's not, it's not, sour for the same reason that we call a person sour. Now it's it's not a coincidence that we call them both sour. There's some relationship. Um, and moreover, this sourness is primary, right? Like this is, the lemon is literally sour. The human is like, like certain, something sour in a certain way. It may be hard to say exactly what way, <laughs> I, but, it's, but, but I think that's clearly the case, right? I, I mean, it may just have something to do with the way your mouth moves when you have something sour. <laughs> but in any case, the human is somehow, the sourness in the human bears some kind of relationship to this sourness, even though it's not a member of the same species. Right? I mean, it's perhaps not even a sensible quality at all, right? Like it's a, it's a kind of character trait. So again, it's a disposition of some kind. It's like, a, it's similar to a virtue or a vice. Yeah. I'm still a bit unsure on species. Would it be correct to say that a species is like the uh the category above an individual? So that so I mean the point that Porphyry and um I want to move on from this soon because I want to get to the actual discussing this problem, right? But but these questions are all good, so I'm having a hard time moving on. Um right. So I mean so again, the way Porphyry um, um, 
Porphyry offers one definition of species that he says only applies to the lowest species. Right, that it, right, that it, that it, that a species is something that is that is um, said in the what is it of things that differ numerically, that is like only numerically. Right, so that only applies to the lowest species because this mortal animal, for example, is said of things that differ in species, not just numerically. Right, so by that definition of species, this is a species, and this is, and these are all genera. Right, so everything up here would be a genus, but not a species. But there's another definition of species where he says, where basically anything that falls under a genus is called a species. Right, so from that point of view, you say this is the lowest species. This species, th this is a species relative to this, but a genus relative to this. And, you know, of course, when you get high enough up, high enough up, you get to the highest genus substance. So it's it's finite both directions. Okay. Are there other questions about this? Yes. Um so Aristotle's system relies a lot on language and what we can and can't do with language. Why, why do we say he's doing philosophy and not linguistics? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, I think a lot of philosophy is linguistics. <laughs> a lot of linguistics is philosophy, at least these days. But yeah, um, <laughs> the um, well, um, I don't think. Don't think Aristotle is doing. Aristotle is definitely talking about language, as philosophers tend to do, right? <laughs> uh, um, don't think what he's doing would be well described as linguistics. It's not very similar to what people we call linguists do. Uh, um, although, as I was kind of, I don't know, sarcastically with it, something. Uh, suggesting there is a lot of like certain types of philosophy have kind of colonized linguistics, right? <laughs> so there's, there's some philosophical dogmas even that, that seem to pervade the discipline of linguistics. But but on the whole, still linguists are not doing what the same thing that philosophers do. I mean, this is what I just said is really weird in the sense that am I doing the same thing that Aristotle does? Philosophy? <laughs> Notice what kind of question that is. Like, is it the same in kind or is it different? <laughs> um, so, uh, it's a philosophical question. <laughs> um, but yeah, I don't know how to give, give you a better answer than that, why we don't call what he's doing linguistics. I think, I mean, a, a different question, but I think, I mean, so that question is in some sense impossibly difficult because it involves the definition of philosophy, right? Like when we call something philosophy and when don't we? When should we call it philosophy? When shouldn't we? Or something like that. In another sense, it's easy because you just say, well, look, look at the things we call linguistics, and Aristotle is just not doing them, right? He's not doing historical linguistics, he's not doing syntax, and that. I mean, but uh, but um, but I guess a hard question would be something more like, why don't we call what, what Aristotle is doing philosophy of language rather than metaphysics? Um, and, you know, I mean, uh, the way someone like Porphyry is interpreting Aristotle, it it should be, it shouldn't matter what language you do it in, or, right? We should be talking about the kinds of things there actually are. Um, but you're right that that it seems like a lot of things about the structure of sentences and whatever have somehow the structure of Greek sentences. <laughs> 
right? Like the fact that there's no indefinite article in Greek seems to have made its way in here somehow. <laughs> um, uh, um, so that's like a worry for, it's, I mean, it's either a worry for Porphyry's interpretation, right? And then you could come up with an interpretation of Aristotle where what really is interested in is, is how you speak. And logos means speech and, you know, right? Like, or it could be a worry for the, like, Aristotle is doing what Porphyry thinks he's doing, but perhaps he's being misled by the structure of of his language. He's a, he thinks he's discovering metaphysics, but he's actually just doing grammar, right? A, a lot of people have said that, <laughs> something like that. In, in, in a sense, the medieval novelists already were saying something like that. If not, they wouldn't necessarily say it of Aristotle directly, but they would say it of the previous interpreters of Aristotle. <laughs> You've misunderstood him because the way you're doing it, you're just you're confusing metaphors with language. Um, is that I don't think I can give a better answer than that right now. Let's see a follow-up question. Maybe a better way to ask that is does Aristotle's epistemology and metaphysics rely entirely on his analysis of language? Do other things that are propping that up? What? I I mean, by rely on, do you mean like does Aristotle? Um, kind of like first establish some principles about language and then deduce metaphysics and epistemology from them? No. <laughs> they, uh, uh, rely on, well, I mean, in an obvious sense, it does rely on them, right? Because again, you imagine, I, and I think, I, I feel like Aristotle is always imagining this. <laughs> like imagine that Plato's Socrates suddenly comes in. and says, oh, that's very interesting what you're doing, Aristotle. Let me ask you some questions about it, <laughs> right? And, you know, um, so that, that's what I was saying before, how the analysis of language is necessary to protect the other stuff he's doing. Um, um, so in that sense, I think it does rely on it, right? But, I, but the trickier question I was just, is that does it kind of, is there some like, well, either are we misunderstanding a lot of what he's doing because it really is about language, or is he misunderstanding a lot of what he's doing because it really is about language and he thinks it's not? And that, like I said, that's a that's a hard question. Yeah. And speaking on the, the Socrates point, there is a, a point in the reading, I think, where Aristotle says that we should check if uh, the difference is not a certain quality, but an individual of this. Would that be like, you know, Socrates asking someone to define the beautiful and they go, you know, this painting is really beautiful. Or uh, well, just look at uh, my good friend, uh, you know, Alcibiades, he's beautiful. Yeah. As, as something that's trying to define beautiful by the individual, I don't know. Uh, maybe that's the kind of move he has in mind that you're, you're supposed to detect that way. I'm not sure. He doesn't give an example. So. I mean, that does happen in platonic dialogue. Right? Like that's the first thing that happens in the Mino. Socrates asks what you know what virtue is, and, and Mino says, "Well, for example, courage." Blah blah blah. There, you know, Socrates says, "I only asked for one thing, and you gave me a whole pile." <laughs> right. Anyway, uh, those aren't such individual lists, but anyway, it's that kind of thought. Yeah. Um. Okay. I want to get I want to get onto this question, but are there other questions about how this is supposed to work? Okay. So um, so. 
um, what are differentiating? And we we have a few examples. Like we have no example of a differentiate of horse. And it's hard to imagine what it might be. Right? Uh, we have a few examples. Um, rational is one, apparently. Uh, although there's also bipedal floating in them. So rational, I don't know what that is. It, I mean, rational again appears to be the name of a like um, disposition or like capacity, potency. Um, uh, it appears to be like ability to sail or ability to laugh, something like that. Um, that would seem to make it a quality. You look back at the list of qualities in the categories. Bipedal is, I guess, is a shape. I mean, of course, it's more than just a shape. Right? I mean, something where this shape but couldn't like do this or whatever. I don't know. Talk by, maybe I don't know. Anyway, let's say bipedal is a shape. Shape we know is a is a type of quality. That's on the list of qualities. Um, the other, so rational, bipedal, and the other example we have is the differentia of the elements. Um, so, actually, let's reading you. Right. So this is from a book called On Generation and Corruption. Um, and it's a passage where Aristotle is trying to prove that there are four elements. <laughs> um, now, like he wasn't the first one to come up with these four elements. In fact, I guess these four elements are really widespread, like they're in China or whatever. But anyway, uh, so but Aristotle, but Aristotle is trying to explain why there are these four elements. Right, so the four elements are earth, water, air, and fire. Um, now, I mean, it's a little weird because each one seems to have two differentiate, whereas it should only have one. <laughs> but, um, but anyway, we know what they are, right? Like hot, cold. Dry and moist. There's two pair, these are two pairs of contraries. So uh, contraries means maybe it just means this, or anyway, it certainly implies that you can't have both of them together. Right? So that's Aristotle goes through this little accounting thing where he says, so like we have four things. There's six different ways you could form pairs of them, but two pairs are impossible, so there's four pairs. Right, so like hot and dry is air, and cold and, no, sorry, cold and dry. And... Air is moist, I think, right? Oh, right, yeah. air is moist. Cold and dry is earth, hot and dry is fire, cold and moist. Oh, hot and moist is air, is air and cold and moist is water. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> okay. Ah. Um. There's a really interesting. No, I should just. Sorry. <laughs> there's a paper where Feynman, the physicist, explains what temperature is by using the analogy of moisture like this seems to again like a human would say our imagination tends this way right like it seems like this analogy seems good <laughs> so, anyway um uh well so these are these are definitely qualities and moreover they're sensible qualities
and they seem to be in the category of quality, right? So this, right, because this is the issue we're going to face. Um, Aristotle says straight out in certain places that the differentiae are qualities. Um, right, like, so for example, here's reading Q um, from the topics. Um, when something is given in a definition as a differentia, I added a differentia, I added that part. One should check whether the differentia signifies not a certain quality, but a certain individual this. For it seems that ever differentia signifies a certain quality, right? So there Aristotle says straight out that a differentia is a quality. Um, and similarly, in reading V from uh, Metaphysics Book 5, that's the, that's the book about the different ways things are said, right? So, and this is the chapter on the ways in which quality is said. Quality is said in one way as the differentiate of a substance. There it is, right? Differentiate of a substance is a quality. But you might say, well, that perhaps quality is said in many ways. I mean, actually Aristotle just said, quality is said in many ways, right? Quality is said in one way as differentiate of substance. But maybe, you know, um, that's one way you can use the word quality, but quality referring to the genus of accidents is another. Okay, but reading you seems to rule that out because, um, well, no, actually not reading you, uh, reading T. Okay, this is from Aristotle's Physics, chapter one, uh, book one, chapter five. Okay. It is manifest then that some of the principles must be contraries. Okay, never mind exactly what the principles are here. He's trying to find out like what are the principles of all natural things. And he's, you know, and he decides there must be at least two principles because he proves that they must be contraries. So there have to be two contraries. But then he says, um, But furthermore, we said that substance is not opposite to substance. Right, so this refers to the quote um, that I just gave from the categories above, reading S. It belongs to all substances, there is no contrary to them. Right, like what's the contrary to Bucephalus or the contrary to human? Like what stands to human in the same relationship that hot stands to cold? Aristotle says nothing. It doesn't apply to substances. They don't have contraries. So reading T says that like therefore there must be a third principle. It goes on, how can a non-substance be prior to substance? Sorry, but how could a substance be composed of non-substances? Or how can a non-substance be prior to substance? Right? So that so the reasoning is this: we have two principles and they're contraries. And because they're contraries, they must not belong to the category of substance. That's the argument Aristotle is making there in the physics. So because they're contraries, they're not substances, they're accidents. Now, I mean, if you go through actually the other categories, most of them also don't have contraries. It's really qualities that have contraries. There's some sense in which quantity, but basically qualities that have contraries, but in any case, whether it's a quality or not, it's definitely an accident, right? And then he says, but, if, but of course a substance for example, a natural substance, which he's find, trying to find the principles of, 
right? A uh, natural a substance can't be made out of non-substance. So these can't be the only two principles, whatever they are. There has to be another principle that's a substance, and it doesn't have a time. Okay, so um, so like going back to the generation and corruption passage. Um, it seems like we're still talking about the exact same thing. Um, um, the uh, tangible qualities are going to, so like why the tangible qualities? I mean, presumably because body is essentially tangible. Right, like touch is the is the is the sense that directly senses body. <laughs> um, but I mean, he doesn't say that. But anyway, presumably that's why. So, um, so that the we're looking through the list of tangible properties. Um, we're going to use contrary tangible properties to differentiate different simple substances or elements. Um, uh, and, you know, then, so he, he narrows it down to these two pairs of contraries. Um, and then he says, these must be the differential. So it seems like we're talking about something in the genus of quality that's an accident and not a substance is differentiating these elements. Yeah. Sorry. This drawing. This drawing? Yeah. I, I don't know exactly what all the parts of the drawing mean, but <laughs> right, but you know, he, in that passage from the physics, this is reading T. He says, you know, uh, we've determined that that Physical things or natural things have there have to be two principles at least. Um, I mean, it, the truth is, if you went down that passage and saw what the principles are, it would get super confusing. That's why I didn't <laughs> go on to the passage. But just taking that little piece, <laughs> it says um, physical things have to have at least two principles because he think he's shown. That principles must be contrary to each other, basically because motion involves like going from one thing to another, right? So there have to be principles that are contraries. And but then he says, um, but therefore these principles can't be substances because substances don't have contraries. There's, I guess you say these principles can't be a type of substance or something like that, right? Um, because substances don't have contraries. And then he says, and since substances can't be made of things that are not substances, there must be some other principle. Um, and all I'm trying to get from that at the moment is that it seems like he's really serious that these things that have contraries are, are are qualities and not substances, right? So when we go back to the thing from generation and corruption, we say the elements are differentiated by these contrary qualities. It seems like we're saying that these are qualities in the sense that they are they belong to the genus of quality and they're not substances. Yeah. Sorry, he's saying that um, all physical things have contraries, which are the first two principles, but then because Substances can't have contraries, and it's a physical thing, then it must have a third principle to make it a substance. A physical thing is a substance, right? I mean, that was right. Yeah. I'm so, and why the physical thing has to have the contraries? That's just because of physics. Yeah, like I said, that's the argument before the passage, right? He's, you know, right? Because he says at the right, it starts. It is manifest then that some of the principles must be contrary, right? So then because of what he said before, right? So like I didn't I didn't explain that and it, like 
I mean, I kind of just returned to the explanation, right? That 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 nature nature is a principle of motion. Physical things are are movable things, and therefore they must have um, principles that like exclude each other so that right. they can change from one another. And that's like the thing with the elements, right? Like that's what you're using he or he is using the elements as examples of. Yeah, the, so the elements presumably are, I mean, it's from different books. It's, it's, it's like completely different contexts, but, it, but presumably the elements are an example of, uh, I mean, again, it's a little weird because when you figure out what these principles actually are, it, it, it raises a whole other set of problems. <laughs> but yeah. Sorry, can you say that um, all physical things must have uh, at least two contrary principles, or some physical things will end up having mm -hmm. uh, at least two contrary principles. Yeah. I'm afraid I'm going to get to. Um, it turns out that one of the principles is privation. <laughs> like not having something so like so actually every natural thing both has something and doesn't have something else and that's why it's capable of change um but uh um but yeah maybe it's easier like i mean it's easier to understand it just to say that physical things in general have to have there have to be at least two contrary principles of physical things in general uh, easier to understand. I, I mean, okay, so just like remember, this is not a course about Aristotle's physics, <laughs> right? So I mean, um, and I'm really introducing this stuff in order to understand the readings we're doing next time, and I, so like, I'm just taking pieces out of context that, but, but that present certain problems for interpreters right and like uh um of course the interpreters also have the problem of putting those pieces together with all the other pieces that they also know about that we don't <laughs> um so uh but i'm trying to limit it to you know so um um and the, you know, the reason I said it gets you caught, you know, so like you, I mean, of course, we do tend to think of cold and dry, I guess, as privations, but right, that like cold just means not being hot. And but um, but Aristotelians tend to think of these as two qualities, two different qualities. So, um, so the connection between this and this actually gets complicated once you once you realize what these. And that that's what I'm trying to that's what I'm trying to shove under the rug. So I don't have to deal with it. All right. Um, uh, all right. So so like that's that's a case for saying that differentiate our qualities. They're in the genus or category of quality. Right. Remember, a category, at least according to Porphyry, a category is just the highest genus. So um, they belong to the genus or category of quality. Therefore, they don't belong to the genus or category of substance. They're accidents. OK. Um, However, now looks at, let's look at reading X. So this is from um, chapter five of the categories, um, the chapter about substance. It is common to all substances not to be in a subject. Right, so that we already knew, right? That was like, we remember we had that diagram and if this was, I don't remember which way I drew it before, but if this is in a subject and this is not in a subject, then the substances were down here. 
when the accidents were up here. Right? So it is common to all substances not to be in a subject. For a primary substance is neither said according to a subject nor is in a subject, blah, blah, blah. I don't read all of this. But this is not a proprium of substance. Now, like whether proprium here can, can be understood as a kind of accident or what is not clear, but 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 it but it is the question is whether not being in a subject belongs to all substances and only substances. That's the question he's asking. And he says it's it, so it does belong to all substances. That was the first part. But now he's saying, but it's not appropriate because it doesn't belong only to substances. What else does it belong to? Um, rather, a differentia too is not in a subject. <laughs> okay, so this is really weird, right? Because what, on the one hand, this seems to be a really strong proof that a differentia is not a substance. By the way, you might ask, uh, wouldn't it be bizarre, bizarre? How could they be substances? Like, they're not things like horses and people and whatever, right? Whatever they are. But I think that the answer could be that they're parts of substances and therefore substances, right? That's that. That's what people who, who say they're substance are gonna say. All right. So, but um, but reading X seems to rule that out because the whole proof that this is not appropriate relies on differentiate being out here. Or maybe I should say, I mean, they're in here somewhere, but they're not substances, <laughs> right? But of course, that also means they're not accidents because they're not up there. <laughs> Right, so reading X seems to leave the differentiate in a kind of like weird middle place. But there shouldn't be a middle place, like something either is in a subject or it's not in a subject. Um, uh, so, um, um, So, so it looks like maybe, maybe this classification is not complete. I mean, maybe that's what he's saying when he says there's something that's not a substance that's also in this box somewhere. Um, um, but, uh, so that's a possible interpretation of reading X, but that definitely goes against what we were just saying before, right? Because these are these are like I think these are probably literally on the list of qualities in the categories. If if not, they're definitely it's clear that these are sensible qualities, referring to Aristotle, like white and sweet and whatever. Um, so these definitely belong up here. So there seems to be, even if there's a way of understanding X where we say, mm, it turns out there's some other things that are not in the subject, X seems to contradict what we were heading to heading towards before, which is that differentiate our qualities and they're, therefore they're accidents. Um, and, um, Yeah, I guess readings W and V seem to go the same way. Um, so here's reading W. Every substance seems to signify an 
this is also from chapter five of the categories. Every substance seems to signify a certain individual this. Now, with respect to primary substances, it is indisputable and true that they signify a certain individual this. But the phrase I'm translating as certain individual this is um, ade t. Um, this, this part kind of implies that you're pointing at something. Yeah. Um, now, with respect to primary substances, oh, sorry, I read that. For the indicated thing is individual and numerically one. But with respect to secondary substances, they seem similarly from the figure of usage. That's a, I didn't really know how to translate schema tes prosegorias, right? The, 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 right? Schema means shape figure. Prosegoria. I'm not sure how to translate, but anyway, but it has something to do apparently with, right, this is Aristotle himself saying we're misled by the form of language, right, because he's saying that the form of Greek specifically, right, that is that um, like We say human is animal, and that looks just like saying Socrates is animal. I mean, in English, right, these would we wouldn't say these the same way. We would say a human is an animal, and we'd say Socrates is an animal. Right? But again, there's no indefinite article in here, so. Oh, right. So I think that's why Aristotle is saying that like uh, a word like human or animal seems to be the name of a certain individual thing. Right. And that's why Socrates can come to you and say, well, you agree that there is human. Right. And you say, yes. <laughs> and then you say, and, 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 but then he leads you in a few steps to admitting that there's one human that all humans are like images of or something like that, right? <laughs> because there has to be, there's, there's something that is the human, right? Um, so uh, I don't know if he actually does, well, in the Parmenides they use humans. This is not the type of, Actually, this is not the type of example that Socrates is usually interested in, right? It's something Kant points out about Plato, right? That what Socrates is really interested in is you agree that there is justice, right? <laughs> that, that's the type of, you know, so, but, um, um, but he, like, he does admit that there's forms like this too, and then he has problems with it. Parmenides causes problems for him in the, in the dialogue called Parmenides. Um, all right, so anyway, um, so they seem to signify a certain individual of this, um, but, uh, but this is not true. Rather, they signify a certain quality. Right? So, poion t. Like, poion is actually the word for, like, the, it's actually an interrogatory word, right? Like, if you say, um, there's only one word for it in English. But, if you say, like, what kind of thing is this? Um, um, this and, and, and this is the word that's translated, well, so strictly speaking, I think this word should be translated quale and quayates, which is the uh, 
abstract noun should be translated quality. But in fact, this is often translated quality. I haven't tried to make that distinction in my translation, right? So a certain so 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 this means like um a certain how a certain how, something like that. <laughs> um a certain howness. Oh, and I'm out of time. Um but so I'll just say, right, so so reading W like seems to reach the conclusion that secondary substances are kind of kind of quality. That obviously isn't this kind of quality. And I think if you put that together with um uh reading V, you can see more evidence for why. You might say, yeah, the differentiator qualities, but they're not this kind of qualities. All right, that's all I have time for, and I will see you next time.